Uh, welcome to Judaism and Anime. Um, I'm Frobor. Um, I'm amazed that my voice is still working because this is going to be, I think, our seven of panels I'm giving this weekend. Um, so hopefully it'll last for the panel. Um, let's dive straight in. All right, before we dive in, I want to talk a little bit about something called death of the author. A lot of this stuff, you might say, I don't know if they really meant that. I don't know if they really intended that. I don't care. What a work, any work, is a collaboration between the creator and the viewer, the creator and the reader, you know, the creator and, and whatever. Um, when you watch something, you are bringing to it all of your own attitudes, all of your own interpretations, and the work that happens in your brain is not the same work that happens in the brain of the person sitting next to you. Um, you create the meaning. The author creates the work, you create the meaning of the work. That doesn't mean that any work can mean anything. It doesn't mean that, you know, Evangelion is actually about Swedish macroeconomics. Um, it means, though, that whatever, you know, that if you can take elements of it and say, this element to me means this, and this is my evidence for it. If you can do that, you are right. And the person next to you who can do the same thing is right, even if you're contradicting each other. So that said, um, some Jewish references that I'm talking about here may be intentional, others probably aren't, but we can still find them there and have fun with them. And because this isn't about being right, this is about finding something interesting, finding something fun, having you know an interesting conversation. And some of them I think really are intentional. Um, the other thing I want to say is, you know, there really there are maybe five Jews in all of Japan. Um, there aren't a lot of Jews in Japan. There isn't a lot of Judaism in Japan. Judaism isn't something that the Japanese are particularly familiar with, much like the way anime uses, you know, other Western ideas, you know, the way FMA uses alchemy, the way everything since Evangelion uses Christianity, that kind of thing. Um, they're mostly taking it as a source of cool symbols, neat ideas. They're not, you know, it's, you're not going to find realistically portrayed Jewish characters in anime. Honestly, you're not going to find Jewish characters at all. Maybe, maybe Spike Spiegel. <laughs> That's the only one in everything I've seen that I think might be Jewish. Jewish. Huh? Think he Jewish. does have a Jew pro. He has the same hair I had when I was a teenager. <laughs> um, and, but what you will find are traditional Jewish uh, legends. You will find lots of Kabbalah references. You will find Jewish tropes, Jewish ideas, even when you don't find, you know, the actual meat of the religion. Um, so, let's get into one Jewish legend that has been hugely influential, not only on anime, but on Western uh, entertainment. <coughs> and it's one that doesn't get pointed out much. The Golem of Prague. The Golem of Prague is an old Jewish uh, folktale. Um, Prague was the site of, of frequent uh, pogroms. Um, pogroms were, uh, starting in the Middle Ages and going through uh, basically until World War II, uh, pogroms were anti-Semitic riots. Usually they were whipped up by the authorities because the people were getting restless and they needed, you know, they didn't want the restless peasants turning on their lords. Let's find somebody else to get them to turn out. And so they would whip up anti-Semitic frenzies. A lot of, you know, the stereotypes of Jews, a lot of the, you know, you know, the, the blood libel, that kind of thing, grew out of these Eastern European pogroms. Um, so in Pro Prague was a frequent site of these pogroms because it had a large Jewish community and a large non-Jewish community, and it was a you know a major important city um, in the region. So there grew up this legend that a medieval rabbi created an artificial superman out of clay to be the protector of the Jews of Prague. Um, the golem is, you know, this clay man that is practically indestructible, super strong, basically the first superhero. And 
he is the protector of the Jews of Prague, and he is controlled by the divine word. The, the, either, in some versions, it's the name of God. In some versions, it's the, you know, the Hebrew word for life. In other versions, it's a secret word. Um, with divine power that was known to you know the rabbis of old and has now been forgotten, but it allowed it brought the golem to life with divine power and allowed you know and and you know how's that? There are a lot of golems in anime. Pokemon draws heavily on the po on the golem legend for a lot of different Pokemon. First of all, there is the Pokemon Golem. Um, but I think an even better example are uh, the legendary golems, who are unique, ancient, unique protectors of this ancient civilization that were artificially created and mystically brought to life. And if you can solve the puzzle, find the secret word, you can bring them to life to work for you. Um, also, by way of Dungeons and Dragons, you know, Dungeons and Dragons put in golems as these magical constructs wizards could create and control. Um, that then, um, Dungeons and Dragons had quite a bit of influence on early fantasy anime, and in turn, fantasy anime are full of golems. Slayers has hysterically funny golems. Um, this is from the best Slayers movie. I forget actually which one, it, which number it is, but um, that golem is actually powered by a wizard inside it um, and is hysterically funny because it's, you know, 30 stories tall and makes little squeaky noises when it walks around um, and has battles with other golems. Now, this notion of the golem competed with another o notion of creating artificial people, the Frankenstein myth. Um, these two myths kind of battled it out in early American, American science fiction a century ago. Isaac Asimov, um, who was Jewish and was very familiar with the uh, golem legend, got really sick of every story about robots being a Frankenstein story. You know, the robot always turns against us. It's always evil. It's always such an act of hubris to try to do this. So he wrote a different kind of robot, a robot that was a protector. And this became very influential throughout all of science fiction all over the world, this notion of the, the protector robot. Um, all of mecha anime ultimately comes from the Golem of Prague. Especially the early mecha shows where they didn't have a pilot. Where it was a kid who with the power of knowing the right words or having the remote control could control and bring this protector to life to defend the city from you know, whatever was attacking it. You know, and that still continues down to this day, the notion of this ancient forgotten protector that if you can find and speak the right word, um, the divine word, it'll come to life and protect your city. So that is one big influence. 